I'm John Giannoli, and I've had the same experience as most of these people have. You know, I, and like that other lady said, you don't miss what you don't have. You know, so I didn't miss air conditioning when I was growing up. Uh, we got a box window unit when my dad first bought, bought the house in, in uh, 1945. And that would draw the air out of the house, but into the windows, the rest of the windows. And that, that was our air condition. <laughs> but we played outside. It was like, you know, you, you went home for lunch, you went back outside until they called you in at night. <laughs> you know? So, and, and you always had to go in, because once you went in, was left with bath in, the, in bed. <laughs> so, so uh, that was the end of the day. But, uh, we used to, in the daytime, we'd go out and we'd play, and you get hot and all, and uh, we'd get like a big pot, put water, and put ice cubes in it. And we'd sit around and we'd all take the ice cubes and suck on them and all this stuff. We didn't, we didn't know we would catch germs from each other, which <laughs> we never did. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, that was always a good experience. We used to, you know, play games around the house. We had uh, two lots which had uh, the, the, the pillars, you know, that you're supposed to build a house on. And we'd play like this was a cemetery or something. Uh, we'd play war games, because this was, you know, right after the war, you know. Uh, so <laughs> that was very popular. And everybody had uh, cap guns and uh, little later BB guns and stuff, which I don't know if they can play with anymore. but. Uh, it, it was it was good times and, and yeah at nighttime you, you, like I say the parents were on one porch and we'd be on the other we'd be telling ghost stories and you know stuff like this and uh, it just it, it was a lot a little closeness together you know and then later on my uncle used to take us out to the lakefront and uh, we'd stop and get a bucket of uh, clams break up the clams and we we bait different areas and put a lamp. By each one, and we had a casting net. We cast for shrimp, and that was always fun. That was like on a Friday night, you know. So, <laughs> and uh, let's see what other experiences I really enjoyed. Well, just about everything. You know? We used to ride our bikes all over. We used to go to uh, Stalin's playground, you know, to swim in the summertime. The mornings were always for lessons. Well, I knew how to swim from having lessons at five years old. But we'd still go there just so you could be in the water. And we usually get kicked out because we horse around too much. But the evening times, you could just swim and, and play and do what you wanted. So that was another good experience. My first time of getting the air condition was when we bought a house. This was about 1966. And it had a little windy unit in the master bedroom. And that was it. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't really cool a lot, you know. But uh, then later on, around 1972, I got a house with central air conditioning, which was, which was really nice. <laughs> so, uh, so our kids did experience, you know, uh, not having air conditioning for a while. And I guess they appreciate it now. But now that you have air conditioning, when you go outside, you want to go back inside. So you don't have that, uh, you don't meet your neighbors and all like you used to. And uh, that's what I miss about you know, having air condition and not, you know, not going around the neighborhood so much. I still do it, but not, not like we used to, you know. And uh, that's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My name is George A. White and um, a native of uh, Western St. Tammany Parish, growing up in the sprawling metropolis of Holtonville, Louisiana. H-O-U-L-T-O-N-V-I-L-L-E, not Holtonville, but Holtonville. We, have, we had a, a voting address of Mandeville and a mailing address of Madisonville. It was in the in Eastern St. Tammany Parish. And growing up uh, during, during such hard times, the development of air conditioning by Dr. Carrier in 1902 was non-existent, period. So 
my first time even hearing of air conditioners, I was a first grade at Madisonville Rosenwald, and we would go to Covington on weekends, and Dr. Keddy, the local doctor, I knew where his office was, and they were just Big, big boxes hanging out the window. Oh, Dr. Kenny's got air conditioning now. Wow. Well, I, I, I had no experience what air conditioning, air conditioning was like. Now, starting school in 1954, you'd pass and you'd see one on the bus sticking out of someone's house. That's an air conditioner. That, that, what is that thing all about? We would go to the store, the riverfront store here. A woman's called Wascom, a woman's called Pennington's, Ray Stein, Stein Grocery and Market. And the doors would be open, screen door, and there was a little sign, uh, cigarettes before in, in vogue. And those places that did have air conditioning would have the little penguin holding the sign that said, cool, air conditioning, come in. If you can remember those. The other places had a screen door with the, with the push bar that said Merida, Sunbeam, no, yeah, Sunbeam Bread, or Wholesome, or one of the others. It's full screen. We thought it was the biggest thing because behind the meat market was a fan, six foot five, six foot fan, pulled air through the, the building. Now, everywhere we went, your body was conditioned to the humidity, period. People say, oh, it's a lot hotter. Yeah, it may be one degree hotter, but our bodies were conditioned. This is the air condition we use in church. <laughs> okay. And now notice this one says North Shore and, and the Chamber of Commerce, but they generally had a funeral home's name, a burial policy's name, or some other feature, and they were, they were set right at the edge of the church pews, and everyone would get one. And fancy folks had one that was lady that would, would come out, and they would find them themselves. My first experience of air conditioning when I first started working in 1960 as a, a little kid hustling yards, and I would go to the door in Covington Country Club, and this cold gust of cold air would hit me. Boy, what is that? Okay. Later on, by 1964, I was working for an electrical contractor, and I was helping to install the systems, but I'd never experienced one. I'd been in and out of buildings by the time. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, high school, elementary school, the whole bit, no air conditioning. As I end this, my first time sleeping in an air-conditioned building. I was 22 years old, was senior at Southern University of Baton Rouge, and I went home for the weekend with a guy from Hanville, Louisiana. And all I could say, boy, when I graduate, I'm going to get some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and since 1973, uh, 72, I've lived in a building with air conditioning. My first house, people were, thought I was crazy. I said, I want a house that has central heat but no central air. Man, you're crazy. Well, they didn't know. I knew how to put, a, put, put the system in. The Ream Company had a hang-on kit for $600, and I, I did my own hang on kit because I, I had the basis there. So since that time, I've enjoyed air conditioning. Our bodies have gotten conditioned to the less heat, and 50 cents of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Wet bulb, dry bulb, sens sensible temperature, it, it's called. Where you remove the humidity from the, from the skin and run some air across it, you're going to get a sensation of cooling. That's the end of my little story. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Louis Chopin Cusax, better known as Choppy, and I want to talk about a hot time in Natchitoches. Now Natchitoches is a little town in North Louisiana. It's the oldest inhabited place in the state of Louisiana, and it's the only place in Louisiana that was ever the capital of Texas. But that's another story. I finished high school in Natchitoches in 1950 before air conditioning was well established. And so the old folks used to be out on the porches every evening, enduring the heat a little bit less severely than they would indoors. And drifters would come through the area wanting to pick up something to maybe sell or just use while they were around. And very typically, someone would start strolling down the street. Now, Natchitoches had a three-man police force, and there'd be one cop on duty. So the phone would ring at the police station, and they'd say, Stranger walking down Henry Boulevard. 
and a few minutes later, a call would come in, stranger in the next block of Henry Boulevard. And that would continue until at some point there'd be a call that said, stranger walked into Miss Sally's house, but Miss Sally and all of her family are over at Tijan's. Aha. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So the policeman would call a couple of the local hunters and give them the address and they'd take the plugs out of their shotguns, put in some double O buck, and walk down to the location. Policeman would drive up to the front, park his car, get out, walk up to the door and knock on it, and the prowler would start out the back door, and a hunter would step out from behind a tree, flip off the safety on his shotgun, and the prowler would turn around and go back in and head to the front. He'd get to the front, he'd see the policeman in front of the front door, and he'd see the other hunter behind a tree out front covering the policeman. At that point, he'd usually go out the door with his hands out front, ready to be cuffed and carted off. And the next week, we'd read in the paper about someone wanted in Detroit or Chicago or some such place that was picked up prowling through Natchitoches. Of course, nowadays with air conditioning, they're not out on the porch and they don't leave the houses unlocked anymore. Uh, we never bothered to lock a house back then. But it was fun growing up there, and now it's entirely different. There are a whole bunch of street lights and a whole bunch of stop signs. But the most exciting thing that happened in the city when I lived there was I had some cousins, twins, whose families had two cars, and there was an automobile accident at the traffic light, the two cars colliding. And it was really funny. That, uh, that was the most exciting thing that I can remember from my time in Natchez. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sheila Delacroix. What did we do before air conditioning? In my house that my dad built in 1950, we, Daddy installed an attic fan. And for those who have never seen an attic fan, it's a giant fan that is permanently installed in the attic. And when you click it on, in our house, it was in the central part of the house, and when you clicked it on, the, um, there were louvers that opened so that the air could rush through. And when you turned that sucker on, you know, it was like a 747 taking off in your attic. And, uh, but you could immediately feel this rush of air through all the windows. And it, the air circulated really, really well with that giant attic fan. So it was fabulous. It didn't, it didn't do anything for humidity and it didn't do anything for temperature, but the circulation part, it had down really good. Um, at some point that, that fan died and Daddy didn't install another one in the attic. He installed um, a giant fan just like that one, but permanently in a window in um, the laundry room of the house. It, the same thing, it circulated the air, it was wonderful. But when I mentioned air conditioning to several of my siblings, they said, Oh, before air conditioning, the big fan in the laundry room, and we could stand in front of it and talk. And I said, oh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> but the fan, you turn the fan on and you could stand in front of it and it was nice and cool. But when you talk into it, it would chop up your words and garble them up. And, you know, so we would stand there and sing into the fan or go yada 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 into the fan. And it would just garble up your words. And because it was a low kind of window, like somebody could be on the outside garbling from the outside and somebody could be from the inside garbling from the It was a big toy as far as we were concerned. <laughs> I mean, hey, it was New Orleans. It was hot. It was, uh, you know, amusement. So, uh... So after that, Daddy bought this air conditioning unit, and actually it's coincidental with the fan. We still had the fan, but Daddy bought this air conditioning unit. It looked just like a window unit, but it really wasn't. It was some kind of box with a fan at the back and a drawer, and you just put ice into the drawer, and the fan just blew over the ice and cooled the room. Um, I won't say it worked well because it really didn't, but it was another toy for us. I mean, we spent so much time feeding that thing ice, it was just a joy. I can remember nights when um, we would be, my mother and daddy would be in bed and we'd be saying, we don't have any more ice, and my mother would say, go to bed, <laughs> go to sleep. If you're sleeping, you don't know you're hot, you know. So that was another really great toy that um, climate control brought into our house. 
Um, the other thing we did in the summer to stay cool was we stayed outside. I mean, really, we did not um, stay in the house where the air was still. We were outside from morning till night, and we had a lot of kids in our neighborhood. We roamed the streets. We found cool spots next to the canal or under a tree or in a tree. And um, when we had been outside all day, just kind of hanging out and looking for cool spots and trying not to get in trouble, at the end of the night, at the end of the evening, um, you know, when it was dark and it was time for bath and beds, you could hear all the mothers in the neighborhood singing us home. And, you know, you would hear, Sheila, because mother would be standing at the back door yelling our names, you know. And then Miss uh, Jefferson, another neighbor, would start calling out names, you know. And it would be Linda. And, and it would, it's a lilting sound of our mother's voices singing us home on a summer evening. And, you know, that's, that's a loss because today, you know, even if you let your kids roam the way they let us roam, which most people don't today, you know, when it was time to come home, you'd just get a text message and it would go bing, bing, <laughs> bing, you know, and your mom would say, text, 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 time to come home. Not the same. Thank you. I'm Dewana Haynes, Dewana Dufresne Haynes. I was born in 1962 and raised in Abita Springs, Louisiana. Um, both of the homes that we lived in there had swimming pools that were fed by artesian wells. Um, I'll tell the story about the second pool. Um, my parents' rule was, and we moved there when I was about six, I think. Their rule was if we wanted to use the pool, we had to clean the pool. And this pool was um, lined with tile all the way around, and the floor of the pool had five marble mosaics in it. But these were not flat mosaics. They had um, concrete poking up in between each one of those little tiny marble tiles. So there was a big star in the middle and daisies in the four corners. And we would have to get down on our hands and knees with a bottle of bleach and those wooden scrub brushes with the dark brown straw and we would scrub each individual tile, hundreds of tiles, until they were snow white. It was beautiful. And we would hose it out, get all the bleach out, get it really clean, scrub all the snails off because it was fresh water. No chlorine, no salt. So all sorts of animals loved to live in that pool. There would be hundreds of snails cr crawling up the side and algae would grow if we didn't keep it clean. So sometimes the pool would just look brilliantly green. <laughs> and then you'd see all these snails, you know, all along all four sides. And the water poured out of a huge urn that was surrounded by ferns. It was just beautiful. And we would drink the water after we cleaned it <laughs> and refilled it. Um, and it tasted just as good as the water coming out of the tap. It was the same water that people could drink from the um, fountain in the middle of town that's not there anymore. Um, and at some point, my parents decided to add ducks to the lagoons on our property. And it never occurred to them that the ducks would discover the swimming pool. And I loved to, that was where mom sent me to get me out of her hair, because I never shut up talking. Um, and I spent most of my time outside and playing, and I don't remember ever suffering from the heat because I didn't experience air conditioning unless I went into our kitchen or my grandma's living room down the road. But the swimming pool was great fun, not because I needed to cool down like the grown-ups did, but because it was an adventure. Sometimes we had snakes in the pool, so my dad trained us to recognize all the poisonous snakes. Um, and I would get in a big inner tube and float in the pool. And for me, the pool was too cold. It was unbearable. It was like getting in ice water. And we would float, and because the water was crystal clear, artesian water, it didn't hurt to open your eyes. So I spent most of my time underwater, floating around, watching the tadpoles, touching the snails. Once in a while, a snake would jump in, and I'd see the snake swimming across. 
and I'd bring my little plastic mermaids out of my parents' cocktail drinks and my Barbie dolls into the bottom of the pool, and I had an entire Magic Kingdom down on the floor before it ever, the Magic Kingdom ever existed. And I would be playing with my Barbie dolls and my little plastic mermaids, and then all of a sudden you'd hear a splash, and I'd see a white belly come down. And we had Pekins and Muscovies and Mallards, but mostly Pekins. And you'd see this little belly, and you'd see the little orange feet flapping along. And if you stayed under long enough and didn't scare them, sometimes they would lay eggs. <laughs> and I'd see an egg come out from under the tail and float very slowly down through the water, and it would hit the tile, and the egg would crack. And the yolk and the white would very smooth, slowly just ooze out <laughs> the bottom of the egg. And of course, they pooped in the pool too. So eventually, my parents decided no more ducks. They didn't, as they were killed by other by wildlife, um, the ducks disappeared. But that was the great fun of the pool for me. Was it was a playground. It wasn't a place to cool off. And I would need blankets when I got out of the pool because I was so cold. And there was one more thing. Right in the middle of the pool, there was a white disc, and it was white marble. And if you pulled that disc up, there was um, a, a valve that could be opened. And I, never, I was never allowed to touch that. But the water seeping up from there was even colder than the water that was in the pool. And it was actually painful to put your fingers around the cracks around that disc because the water was coming from so deep underground. And that's my swimming pool story. My name is Kate DeSalms, and I, um, I have a, a story that I'm going to call Hot, Hotter, and Hottest. And when I was little growing up in New Orleans, uh, down by the river where Carrollton meets uh, St. Charles, it got pretty hot, but we worked around it. We worked with the heat. And what we would do, uh, even as kids, we had the sense to go out. We were out a lot, but we would rev it up in the mornings when it was still cooler, come in in the middle of the day and read and in the, go back out in the later afternoon and stay out till dusk. But the things that we came up with to keep cool as children, um, for example, water gun fights. Oh, we had marvelous water gun fights. And then there was the hose bath army. <laughs> and it got ferocious, but boy, it kept you cool. And my father would get involved in that. And he was really good with that hose. Now, that's the first part, but fast forward now to early adulthood, moving to Abita Springs. This part is called hotter. We were naive enough, my husband and I, uh, we had a three-year-old boy and I was pregnant with my daughter. And we were naive enough to think, oh, we're moving to Abita Springs. We won't need air conditioning, which we were really trying to make ourselves feel better because we couldn't afford it. Well, that old house that we moved into was hot and we moved in the middle of the summer. And around two o'clock in the afternoon, I would be about ready to just give it up. But one of the few people that we knew in Abita Springs had, and here it comes again, an Artesian well pool. And that pool never warmed up because it was not in the sunshine. 
it was under these huge oak trees and it was truly ice cold. And around three o'clock, I would jump in that pool, seven months pregnant, and be reborn, literally. <laughs> to this day, my daughter cannot stand to go into a pool that's cold. <laughs> <laughs> now, fast forward, that was hotter. We had hot, hotter. Now we get to the ultimate. Fast forward to Katrina. And for reasons that I won't go into, it's complicated, um, I had to remain in Abita for Hurricane Katrina, 2005. Yeah, that's right. And all the trees along the side of the house and way into the back, they were down. And the house was spared more or less. It was habitable. But there was the trees, the few trees that remained, there were no leaves left. And it was the hottest that I ever, ever have experienced. And part of it was not knowing when the heck I was going to be able to get out of there. But at night, I would just lie in this heat. And in the daytime, the way that I survived was I ran around in the lightest cotton nightgown that I had, nothing else on, and uh, filled up my old Victorian tub. Now, I was by myself at this point uh, with water, cold water. And I would get in that thing about 10 times a day uh, until five or six days later when my son was able to get in with a load of gasoline and, and get us out. So I'm going to hold up the picture that shows what I looked like <laughs> running around in the backyard with that nightgown. And that's how I survived. That was the absolute hottest I have ever survived. And the lesson there is that despite air conditioning, you never know when suddenly less summer might become suddenly more summer again. <laughs> My name is uh, Patricia R. Pat Verrat, and I really Growing up, I don't remember being uncomfortable with the heat. I was born in 1939, so um, had a lot of heat to put up with. Um, but what I remember most at home were, grew up near St. Bernard and Claiborne. And I remember the sounds that were <laughs> and I could never figure out why they collected rags, but there was the rag man that came through and said, you know, anybody have rags? Anybody have rags? He collected rags. And then there was the vegetable man who sold the vegetables. That was the ice truck that brought ice to the homes. I, I mean, there were so many vendors that were just in the street. And there was the ice cream, you know, whenever the ice cream came by, you know, everybody came out of the houses and bought ice cream. Uh, so I. I, I just don't remember being that, you know, uncomfortable and hot. Of course, I moved to California in 58, so that all of this was before air conditioning. But I remember my older brother who thought it was really so hot that he built a deck outside of one of the big windows off of our dining room and that's where he slept in the summer. He put a pad out there and he slept outside with the mosquitoes. <laughs> the mosquitoes, I was always full of whelps from the mosquitoes and scratching them. Uh, and then the other thing that I can remember growing up, I, um, I had a godmother who lived, uh, I don't know, near St. Charles Avenue. And in the later years, that was my first experience with air conditioning. 
Uh, these godparents of mine didn't have any children, and uh, they had christened me. So I practically lived in that with them, uh, at least most of the time, especially maybe after air conditioning came in. It was wonderful being there because they had a couple of units at their home. They lived um, near uh, Xavier Prep somewhere, and they had bought a new house, and it had a couple of rooms that had window air conditionings in it. And after that, I, in 58, I moved to California. And we didn't have air conditioning there either until later years, because it's really not that, it doesn't get, it gets hot, but it doesn't get hot like all year round. Because so what I remember about Louisiana is that it didn't get, it didn't cool down at night. Where in California, we'd be freezing because every evening it would just, you know, it would drop to like 50, 60 degrees. And in the mornings it would be cold and then it would warm up in the day. But um, I, I, really, I really can't remember being that uncomfortable is, I don't know if you can't remember the bad things and you only remember the fun things, because we really did. All of the, you know, we knew all the neighbors. We had a big family. My mother was from 10, so we had lots of cousins and lots of aunts, and we visited each other. And like everybody else, you know, we spent a lot of time outside. I can remember uh, my brother used to scare me to death because they would tell we would, in the evening, they would tell ghost stories. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess I believed them because it was like when he really told a really, you know, story that, you know, really frightened me. I can remember, you know, not wanting to even go to sleep at night. But, uh, so that's what, that's what I remember growing up with, with so much socializing with, you know, friends and parents and, and, and walking to school, that's the other thing. You know, it was a big thing. We would, you know, all the, they would come out from all of the houses and we'd, you know, all walk to school. And then I'm Catholic, so not only would we walk to school, Tuesdays and Thursdays, the whole school would empty out and we'd go to the Catholic church to get catechism classes. And that was really, that was really, and I often wondered, what did they do after we're gone? There's nobody left in the school. But, uh, because I, and I really remember that. I used to wonder about that. Um, so that's my memories of, you know, pre-air conditioning. My name is Millie Zappi. And I grew up in what you would call the Upper South. And uh, what I remember as a child, we spent a lot of time on the porch. And that was either, you know, cleaning beans, you know, we would string beans and snap them. And that's when we'd spend time with our parents or adults. And then she would let, my mother would let us come outside if it rained. We loved sitting on the porch when it rained, but she would always make us put on our sneakers because they had rubber soles. And she had a rubber mat that she would put down, and we had to keep our feet on that rubber mat <laughs> in case we got struck by lightning. We, we were grounded, you know? <laughs> so, so, but we spent a lot of time out. I think we had enough sense to know to come in if it got really bad. But we spent a lot of time outside and on the porch and I remember um, playing with my friends who, because we lived in the country, so she lived across just the road and down a ways, and my mother would let us roam around. I mean, there really was no control over where we went and, unless, until we got home, you know, we have time to come home at night. So I, I remember going over to my friend's house, and there were a lot of people there, which was kind of unusual, but you know, you're kids, you don't pay attention, so we're outside and we run into the house to to do something and we run through the front living room and there's these people sitting around and there's a casket in the front living room it was her grandmother her grandmother had died and they had a like the wake and people were there sitting with the the dead person and here we are as children just running through like nothing, you know, we're playing. 
that was a little bit of a shock. But anyway, so the one thing I do remember was, you know, we had a big tree in our front yard, and there was a, a two-lane highway that was a main road at the time that went in front of our house, and there was a big curve, you know, like before you got to the house, and then there was a straight stretch, and then there was another big curve as you got past our house. So cars would come around and they would go slow down for the curve and then they'd see the straight stretch and they'd speed up and then all of a sudden they realize there's another curve. So, you know, there was, uh, that was a dangerous place. There had been an accident when I was young, when I was real little, but we were playing in the front yard and we were playing in the tree and it had a big grapevine. So we would get up there and would swing by our feet, with our feet, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things. So we spent a lot of time in the tree. So my mother is on the porch and my sister and her friend, they were older than me and my brother, and they're down there by the tree also and they're talking. My mother's on the porch and I remember it was late summer because it was before school was going to start and she was looking through the catalog to get our clothes. She would buy our clothes from the catalog. So she calls us to the porch to look at the dresses because she saw dresses that she wanted to order for us. So she calls us to the porch. So we just left the porch and we, we or left the tree and we came up to the porch and all of a sudden this car comes flying around the corner. It hits the straight stretch. Then it sees the other curve. It throws on the brakes. They flip they turn upside down and they end up in our yard upside down and the doors, you know, the trunk falls open and all of this beer comes <laughs> rolling out because they were bootleggers and we lived in a dry county and there was a wet county about two counties away and they would get the, the liquor and then, you know, come to the dry county and sell it. So, well, they didn't have such luck this time. And there were two women in the back seat and two men in the front. And one of the women, she was kind of big. And I remember my brother, the car's upside down, and my brother is trying to help her get, you know, and then the neighbor comes over and they're trying to help, you know, another car stop and they're trying to get these people out. And I remember there was this one man, and I think he was the driver, but he got out of the car, and you know they had to have some kind, they had to be hurt something, you know, some, some pain. But he's getting out of the car, and he's running around. And him and the other guy, they're running around, they're picking up the beer, they're trying to find the beer. And there was a lot next to us that was grown, overgrown with weeds and tall grasses. So they're, they're grabbing all the beer, and they're running, they're throwing it into the grass, trying to hide it, because they knew the sheriff was going to be coming, because it's an accident. So here they are, and then this big woman, they get her out of the car, and they have her, these two women sitting on the, the side of our driveway, which there was a little bank. She's sitting on the bank, and I remember going over, and she, she threw up. I remember that. She threw up on our grass, and it killed the grass. <laughs> And that spot was dead for a long time. Because <laughs> I remember going out there, so, you know, like afterwards, and the grass is all grown up, you mow, and that spot was still dead. <laughs> so anyway, but I remember that. That was kind of traumatic. And then we moved to the Deep South. And the first house that my mother, she rented a house before she bought a house. And it had two floors, and the top floor had a screened-in porch. And there were a lot of palm trees, like these big tall palm trees, and it wasn't air conditioned. And it had like bed on a bed on the porch, so when it got really hot, you know, we'd we'd fight to see which one got to go outside and sleep on the bed. But the bad thing about that was they had these big we call them palmetto bugs, but there were these great big roaches that lived in the palm trees. So they would get into that sleeping porch. And I remember one night sleeping, and my little sister had Juan sleeping out there. <laughs> and she, we woke up, and we hear this thump, 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 thump. And it was my little sister trying to kill a roach, because one of those big roaches had gotten in, and she's chasing it around with a shoe, trying to kill that. And then my mother ends up buying a house. When she bought a house, it was just on the ground. And um, 
it didn't have a porch, it didn't have any porches, but it did have uh, a window unit in the front, an air conditioner, and I think that was the first time that I'd ever actually lived in a house that had air conditioning, but it was in the front room. And so, you know, it was all open and you could get the benefit of it, but you had to leave your bedroom door open at night. You couldn't close it. But I do remember the bad thing about it was my mother had her living room furniture. We had a sitting room or a Florida room. And then we had the living room, which had all of her furniture in it, which nobody could sit on. And it was like for company. And so we weren't allowed. We used to go sit on it when she was gone, but then we had to make sure the chair was just right because it swiveled. So, but we used to kid and say that we needed to put velvet ropes up in front, you know, because you know only people, company, value people could sit there, nobody else. But that was my first experience with air conditioning. So that's it. Thanks. I grew up in Mandeville in uh, the. 50s, late 50s. And uh, Mandeville was a very small place then. Typically, what we call now uh, old Mandeville was all of Mandeville, pretty much. And we had a movie theater. It was on the lakefront, uh, right across Gerard Street from uh, Don's Bar now, where that big plantation house has been moved to. Um, it was opened uh, only on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on the, uh, during the winter. But in the summer, it was open every day. But it played the same one movie all week long. And um, I can remember that uh, as we walked down to the movie, we lived on Monroe Street between Marigny and Girard. And when we walked out, we walked to the movie. It was daylight. And it was typically, you know, like 6 o'clock, something like that. Uh, as we passed everybody's house without air conditioning, it's all opened, uh, you could smell what everybody was having for dinner. You'd pass the Basile's rooming house and you could smell the red beans. And you would pass the Maguire's house and you could smell the fried chicken. And it, it was wonderful. And of course, everybody knew everybody. So we would go to the movie and when the movie was out, uh, we'd walk home. Now it's dark. And we were quite young when we were allowed to do this, but we were being watched the whole time. Uh, on the uh, front porches, people were finished with their dinner. They were now out on the screen porches in the front of the house. And out of the darkness would come these voices. Good evening. Did you all have a good time at the movie? That was the only place to go, you know. Did you have a good time at the movie? How was it? How's your grandmother? How's your mom? And then the next house, they would speak to you out of the darkness, you know. And of course, you knew all these people. Well, that was a wonderful memory. I think about that all the time. But then when we were in the movie, sometimes the movie wasn't so great. It was boring. So um, we had no air conditioning in the movie. It was cooled by the lake breezes blowing in. But once I got everybody in the movie and the movie started, they would open the big doors in the front and let the, the breeze come in. Inside, there were these huge fans. They were up on a platform and enclosed in a wire case, except the top was open. <laughs> And the kids would pass their time when they got bored with seeing how many things they could throw <laughs> over the top of the fan so that it went in the top where there was no screen. Popcorn bags, you know, that would get shredded and come spewing out all over the place. Um, and that's kind of my memory of the end of, I remember the movie was uh, uh, being run by a man who was a, uh, kind of a notorious alcoholic and he wasn't too good at watching the front door and kids would sneak in all the time once the movie got started, you know. They'd sneak in by the dozens. And uh, that's it. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs>